Welcome to Global Perspectives. What is happening in the U.S. Congress? For insights, we turn to former Representative Charlie Gonzalez of Texas, who is also affiliated with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Charlie. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I don't know where to start because there are so many different issues that are of interest and would be of interest to our audience. But why don't we start at the beginning for you? Sure. When you were a young person growing up, uh, was, was Congress on your mind? Was law on your mind? What, what were the things that inspired you and what led you to what you've accomplished in your career? Well, <clears throat> public service was on my mind because my father was in public service. And so I was just the right age. Uh, he was a city councilman, then he ran for the state senate in Texas and he was elected. Uh, the first Latino elected to the uh, state Senate in the in state of Texas. Uh, and he filibustered against uh, segregation laws. He held a record, 22 plus hours and such, defeating Jim Crow laws. And you know, I'm about 12 years old then. And I was the right age to travel with my dad back and forth to Austin from San Antonio, which is only 78 miles. Mom and dad had a lot of kids, so I had a lot of siblings, but I was the perfect age. And so I was blessed to spend more time with my father and observe him uh, as a public official. So it was inspirational, and it was just always there. I always knew that I'd be running for office, but uh, I wasn't real sure, you know, what that office would be. And then you decided on law school in college, and um, did that help shape your path? Oh, absolutely. A dad had uh, earned a law degree but never practiced law. But he always told me that it was a way of thinking and, uh, again, it, it gave you discipline, um, how to weigh arguments, the pros and the cons and such, and to express yourself. And so I always knew I was going to be a lawyer and that would give me a, an opportunity. And it did. I was a lawyer for 10 years and then I ran for public office. In Texas, we elect all of the judges. So I was elected county court of law judge, and then I moved up to a higher level, the district court level. And uh, then when dad retired, basically because of his health, uh, I decided I would run, and that was in 1998. And so you took over the same seat that your dad had been in for close to four decades, if I'm remembering correctly. Dad was in office for 37 years in the House of Representatives. I was there for 14 years. Um, so uh, the Gonzaleses had the great privilege of representing the 20th District for 51 years. Um, and I was uh, blessed uh, to have the advantage of my father's good name. Uh, you know, I think economically, financially, uh, the family struggled. And his first really good job was probably being a member of Congress but there were eight children and such. But the one thing I, I think I learned from dad is dedication, commitment, honesty, hard work, and what you really have uh, is the most valuable asset that any family can have, and that is a family's good name. And then there was one more thing that was positive then, which was the environment, and it, I guess it opens up a natural question. What was it about Congress that worked? when your dad was a member, and what was it about it that didn't work that eventually led to your decision not, not to run again, which I know was disappointing to many, many people. But um, w w what is wrong with Congress today? You work with a bipartisan uh, organization. Is bipartisanship alive, or is it gone? Well, it, it, it definitely is, is endangered. I don't know if it's an endangered species or not, uh, but Dad and I came from a safe district. Um, in other words, it was a Democratic district. A Republican probably was not going to win it. The closest a Republican came to winning it was the first time Dad ran. Uh, and thereafter, it was just a solid. And yet, even with that kind of security and such, didn't mean you went to Congress and just said, look, I'm coming back no matter what. I can say, do whatever I want, work with the other side or not work with the other side. That's not the way my father was. He was very opinionated and such. So I learned from him that you had to respect the other side, uh, the opposing opinions and such, and that these individuals were not your enemies. Uh, they were your opponents, which is entirely different. I think today it's really viewed as a zero-sum game, scorched earth, 
They're not your opponents, they're your enemies. And there is a complete breakdown in communication. There's not even the effort to communicate. And almost everything is done with a calculation to hold on to the majority, uh, which means totally disenfranchising the minority. My father was in Congress at a time where the majority of his 37 years, they were in the majority. And I think my father always understood at the committee level, you had to involve the minority. And he was chairman of financial services. So I, I think dad led by example and I was his son. So a lot of it was just viewing him and learning what he valued and the satisfaction that he derived from accomplishment. So by the time you had entered Congress, things had changed dramatically. What, what was it about Congress that was, never, that was not working the way it used to when your dad was there? Well, when I took office in 1999 is when I was sworn in, there were still uh, some really bipartisan chairs of committees. And I was in the minority, but I will tell you, I have the greatest respect for Jim Leach, who was chairman of financial services, the greatest respect for my Oxley, who was chairman of financial services. Uh, and then when I moved over to energy and commerce, the greatest respect I ever had uh, for, uh, for Billy Towson from Louisiana. They're all Republicans. But what they did is they made sure that the minority had a voice. It's the old thing about, <clears throat> I still remember, you know, one day you're drinking the wine, the next day you're squeezing the grapes. So you better remember how to treat people. And it's the golden rule. It's really that simple. That's what's so amazing. It's treat others as you would like to be treated. Respect their opinion. You don't have to adopt their opinion. All you do is have to listen. And by listening, believe it or not, you might learn. And that you don't have all the answers. And that you're not doing everything with a calculation to get reelected. You're not doing everything calculated to make sure you maintain the majority. You can't do it. Um, first of all, it, it's not fair. And you have to think that you're disenfranchising members that represent millions of Americans. That may not agree with you, but they're still Americans. And they have their own opinions, and every district has a different need. But what should dominate the discussion is the national interest. And I think all of that has been forgotten. Oh, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I, I'm remembering members of Congress from years past who would go into the states, into the districts, and they would talk, and you would feel that, yes, they were saying something that they were passionate about, but th there were openings in the conversation. Now it seems like so many of the speeches are delivered with, with forcefulness and this sense that everything you're saying is factual and absolutely right, and there's no room for discussion. And, and that automatically shuts people off who might otherwise want to join the conversation. Well, I actually think, and, and there's still some great people in Congress, and I'm going to tell you now, there are no slackers. They're all exceptional in their own right. Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Socialist, Democrat, doesn't matter. They're all really gifted people, and there's some really super decent people. But I think that you have to look at, at how leadership uh, uh, may approach legislation and always, again, uh, viewed through a prism of political advantage. You know, you, at some point you just can't do that. But I always use this example. It's January 1999, it's freshman orientation. Dick Ephart is our minority leader. And, we ha and he's telling us about our voting card because we vote electronically in the House. And he says, when you vote, he says, well, I'm going to give you advice right now that's going to make my job really tough because I've got to hold us together on issues. But when you vote, vote the national interest first. Vote your district second. And vote your party last. And he says, because you've got to wake up in the morning and still look at yourself in the mirror. And it was the best advice I ever got. You sort of know that, but you're in Congress. It's a debate. There's political considerations and everything else, and you lose the hierarchy or the priority of voting. And suddenly, it's turned upside down. And when that happens, everyone suffers. That's exactly the process I was going through in my mind as you were discussing this. I was seeing the whole thing flipped. It's flipped. And, and uh, how do you get it? I mean, 
You work with a, a, an organization, the Bipartisan Policy Center, that focuses on bipartisan solutions and a, a return to the bipartisanship that you were just describing yes. from past decades. Is is that realistic, or is it so, one, sort of those one of those pie in the sky type things? Uh, can and, and how long is this going to take? Because I, to me, the environment seems so toxic. I don't see it changing in five years or ten. Well, first of all, the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, puts out some great work and tries to give direction, um, advice for what it's worth to Congress as an institution and the people that run it. And so we've identified certain things that can be done. One of the most important, because it lends relevancy to all of the members, and it'd be nice to be relevant in the legislative process since you were elected to represent your district, and that is what we refer to as regular order. And that is that legislation go through the subcommittee, committee, the rules committee, and then to the floor with some sort of fair rule that will allow members to introduce amendments because they weren't on the committee of jurisdiction when we were drafting and marking up and getting the, the legislation ready to uh, move out of committee. Because that's where your relationships are built with the other side. It's when you're working in the committee. I always refer to it as like, you could be at a university, but you don't know the other 40,000 uh, students, but you will know people that you took classes with. The committee room is the classroom. That's where you get to know people. That's where relationships are established, because it's very hard to do it otherwise. You don't see people on the floor. John, let me put it this way. We, we do everything separately. The Democrats meet on one side of the aisle, Republicans meet on the other side of the aisle. We don't even sit together. The Senate sits on one side of the aisle, Democrats, Republicans, and the other. In committee, we've got a center aisle there. We don't even sit next to each other. We don't have light conversation or have interchanges. We just don't. And that is part of the solution. And the best opportunity for that is probably at the committee level. I had a member of Congress once tell me that, and I won't mention the name, that he would love to see something like a brown bag lunch with yeah. people from the, from the other side. And even if it were just once a week, could something like that actually help? All right. I've got to tell you, we tried it. Uh, <laughs> every idea that's been out there has been tried at some point. Uh, the Association of Former Members of Congress actually sponsored, and they would get members that obviously had retired and they would sit at a table and they would bring let's say four democrats four republicans and they'd have lunch and they would discuss it i really found it uh very beneficial i learned things about some of my members uh, fellow members and colleagues i would have never known about their background their family their previous profession and things had nothing to do with legislation just getting to know them as people because we don't get to know each other as people. And maybe that will never happen, but at least in the relationship that is available, which is the legislative process, let's maximize the dialogue, the communication, and the participation. We can do that. Uh, we used to have bipartisan retreats. You know why we quit bipartisan retreats? Because everybody was basically sworn to confidentiality and that everything that was said in that retreat, right, was in confidence so everybody could feel comfortable. Well, guess what? Things were leaking out like crazy, right? And they just said, this is not working because certain things are getting in the press, then people can't respond, people feel like they were taken advantage of, they thought what they were saying was in confidence or expressing just an honest opinion about something, and suddenly they're reading about it in the newspaper. So they quit doing that too. Fascinating. It, it's been said that Congress is capable of infinite good deeds, but at the moment, in many ways, it's its own worst enemy. L let's give you a, a, a role that doesn't exist, sort of a supervisor of all of Congress oh, yeah. for, uh, for a short period of time. How do you fix it? What, what are the initial steps where you begin to encourage more communication? You try to nudge people back toward bipartisanship. And what are the specific issues with the institution itself that need addressing? You know, I, I was an attorney and, and then I was a judge and I've been a mediator. 
And I always thought what Congress needed, but it's not set up this way, is they need a fair set of rules that will be applied by a neutral party, an impartial party, not the Speaker of the House and such, uh, to facilitate the conversation. That's what you really need. Somehow you need some, and I don't know how you accomplish that. But I do know that we, we can come together, but we come together only when there's a crisis. I always use this example, and it, it's the most powerful um, experience that I probably have had. I'm 71 years old now. But when 9-11 happened, they made us evacuate the Capitol. Uh, and they, we all reported to the, uh, the Capitol Police headquarters. Now, senior members, such as the speaker and the majority leader, uh, especially the speaker who is in the line of succession, they got moved out. The rest of us were still on the Hill. But the police said, you will not go back to the Capitol. And we said, we want to go back into chambers and we want to go into session. We need to let the American people know that we're still functioning, even though maybe one of those planes was coming either to the White House or the Capitol, right? Uh, the Pennsylvania flight. Uh, because they were able to get to the Pentagon. People forget all this. So we all sat there and we said, no, we want to go to the Capitol. This is the way I remember it. Maybe other members re, uh, remember it differently. Well, they said, you can go back, but you're not going to be able to get in because the doors are going to be locked. We all marched to the Capitol. We all got on the steps of the United, on the Senate side, and we all sang, God bless America. Republicans, Democrats. And it, it really was meaningful. Why couldn't we have taken that energy, that spirit, where we felt, you know, we were brought together by a common enemy. Unfortunately, it should not necessitate something like that. But those are the moments, which means there are members that are open to close ranks, to come together, to talk, to cooperate. Uh, I don't have the answer anymore. Uh, I, I just really do believe that someone has to make that first move. Someone has to reach out and say, we want you involved in this process. And the way you have it now, it's always been the tyranny of the majority. And of course, in the Senate, they claim there's the tyranny of the minority because of the 60 rule vote. Uh, anything uh, that comes to the floor for a vote is brought to a vote only when you have 60 members. That's been relaxed, and it may be relaxed again. And that's not good. In the House, we don't have anything like that. They can totally exclude the minority. But I saw where Democrats did that to a certain degree, but the Republicans, uh, when I was there, they did it in, in greater measure. And you could say, well, that's just a partisan read on things. I don't think so. But it wasn't healthy. So somehow, I think you just need to reach out. There is one area that I think you could possibly do it, and that is in the election of the speaker. Uh, you know that the majority party is going to win. They're going to elect the speaker. Why not have a discussion with the speaker? You're going to lose the race anyway. Why not have a discussion with the speaker, the, the obvious winner, whoever the Republicans would put up, is to say, we want to cooperate. We're not even going to oppose you. As long as you reach out to us, we want to be helpful. We know you're going to be the speaker. We're not going to make a big contest over something that we know is not going to work out. Start off by saying, we want to work with you, Mr. Speaker. Something like that. And it, people will say, oh, that's Pollyannish. You're dreaming. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Because how that would be interpreted by the American people, it would give them some hope that things are getting better. And I even think then that the speaker would be hard pressed not to include more members of the minority party. It, it seems to me that people, whether they're in Congress or in the population at large, need to be reminded of those instances like the one you just described where we did stand together. And they're not all as dramatic as 9-11 was, but there are many other such instances that if combined into a single conversation could serve as a starting point for the 
sorts of bipartisan conversations, civility, and so forth that we once had, especially when it comes to matters of foreign policy. If, if we can't be unified on matters of foreign policy, I think we really are our own worst enemy. And you can't see political advantage to everything. That's the problem. And I, I think everyone's been so guilty of that, uh, trying to take advantage of what might be a very pressing issue and how can you put the other side in a bad light. No, you know, let's just be responsible, try to find the best way to address the issue. You don't have to vote yes, but by the same token, don't try to set up a circumstance where you make the other person look so terrible and such. And there are instances of great decency and concern and professionalism uh, between and among members. I mean, I've been the beneficiary of a Republican member, and I'll just name him, Frank Lucas from Oklahoma. He's a wonderful individual. <laughs> but one time we were rushing in to vote, two members of the Texas delegation, and we knew how the votes had been scheduled, and we knew that the first vote was was going to be a no and, and you know, the yes, but that what happened is one of the votes was taken care of, so the order was not, and we were rushing back from a meeting, and we went in there the last couple of minutes to vote, and you put your card in the voting slot, and we hit yes. And Frank Lucas looked at us, and he said, uh, you guys really sure you want to vote yes on that? We said, yeah, this is the, the he says, no, it's not. This is where we are renaming the Affordable Care Act this horrible name. <laughs> Do you really want to vote yes? And we're going, that was supposed to be the second vote. So all of a sudden, and I'm just admitting it because I'm no longer in Congress and that's the way we do things. Thank God we had time to change it. Frank was just a decent guy. He knew that it was going to be very embarrassing for us <laughs> to have voted that way. And then I was chair of a task force that basically would decide who was going to be the winner in Florida District 13 because of what was alleged as malfunctioning machines. And we were in the majority. So whatever that task force came up with and then was adopted by the committee, and we're in the majority, goes to the floor, and we're in the majority, we could have declared the Democrat a winner. But what we did is we scientifically you know, looked at the machines and had them examined and came to a conclusion that we couldn't prove there was malfunction, which means the Republican prevailed. How would you want it to have been treated if you were that Republican? Objectively, empirical evidence, right? That's all you did. And yet, it was exceptional. It no longer can be exceptional to be fair-minded, to look for just solutions, and give everyone a chance to be part of the answer. If there were one reform, one change that you could make that would be effective and implemented in the next five years uh, to, to make Congress a, a more effective, more efficient, more fair, more reasonable organization, what would that be? Well, in the perfect world, campaign finance reform, and that's not going to happen. Uh, it, it does things to people's judgment, uh, no doubt, and it impacts performance. Um, as a public official, and that's too bad. Now, internally, as far as process, I go back to regular order, and that is leadership allowing chairs of committees to conduct their own business without getting some directive, introducing some political factor so that you make it very politicized to make people look bad and, and such. So chairs can then conduct their business in a fair and bipartisan fashion. Because I still believe the vast majority of the members of Congress love the institution and what it represents. And it is one of the greatest privileges you could ever have. I mean, we used to vote at 2 in the morning. I'll never forget I was there with uh, Tom Udall, who's now a senator. And, you know, we were tired. But all of a sudden, we're sitting there, and you're in this chamber, and you look up, and you, we both looked at each other at the same time and we said, aren't we lucky? Because we really are fortunate. And with that good fortune comes a lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility. I, and you're letting uh, the whole United States down. And we are unfortunately out of time, but no. thank you so much for joining us today, Charlie Gonzalez. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.
and thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.